All right, welcome everyone. We're uh, having, you know, in, in due fashion, we're having some uh, AV last minute, last minute adjustments. Uh, I want this thing to loop. So as we talk, you have a carousel of images. So this is what they're working on. Uh, I'm assuming everyone here is a huge fan of horror and body horror. Okay, so. Woo! Yeah! Uh, you, found, you found the right place. Uh, so I think while um, we're doing this, uh, hopefully it'll be figured out in the next couple of minutes, uh, I would like to, uh, just so we don't lose any time, uh, introduce our panelists and uh, just maybe say a few things. So uh, I am your host for this occasion. My name is Peter Rostovsky. Uh, very, very briefly, I uh, teach in a few places, uh, so I'm, uh, my day job is uh, pedagogical in nature. Uh, I am a painter, and I uh, also have a horror comic book uh, graphic novel called Damnation Diaries, uh, and I'm a huge fan of the genre. Uh, this is maybe TMI, I was saying this, this is the only genre of consumption that my partner Mary and I can agree on. So uh, we consume uh, vast quantities of horror. And obviously horror, I think, is <clears throat> an incredibly relevant uh, genre for our time. I would like to really dig into the reasons uh, why that is and has a very, very central place in comics, uh, sequential art, uh, graphic narrative, and so on. And I would also like to dig down and find out maybe what, uh, what makes that such a you know, unique and compelling pairing, and also uh, talk to our these illustrious, <coughs> uh, accomplished comics uh, creators about this. So with that said, uh, and I have a list of, uh, as I like to say, diabolical questions for you all. <laughs> so diab I'm, we may not get through all of them, but they are, in fact, diabolical. OK. so. Uh, Starting uh, at the left uh, flank there, Andy Santagata is a YA and adult horror comedy cartoonist and game designer. He's best known for his work on the Five Nights at Freddy's, I'm sorry, on the Five Nights at Freddy's Foz, Fazbear, Fazbear Frights graphic <laughs> novel series. I keep thinking of Fozzie Bear, okay. Uh, his video game Slasher U, an 18 plus horror movie dating sim and his autobiocomic Yennefer's Body. Uh, which won the 2023 Mocha Fest Award of Excellence. Uh, you can find at, uh, at your table. What's your table uh, number? G13B. Okay. So, okay. So, seek that stuff out. And in his spare time, he does post apocalyptic fabrication, LARPing, and plays way too much Overwatch. I kept, Sorry. kept that in. I was like, <laughs> he's like, you don't have to include it. I'm, I'm including that. I said you didn't uh -huh. have to say it, but I'm glad you did. Okay. Um, Corin Halbert is an Ignatz Award-nominated cartoonist and horror artist living and working in the NYC area. We should hang out. I'm also yes. I'm in Brooklyn. Her art is heavily influenced by an avid obsession with 1970s cult films and vintage comics. She's the creator of the comic book series Acid Nun and Scorpio Venus Rising. And where are you on the floor? K6, K6A. Okay. Gigi Murakami. Uh, is an NYC native, Ignatz nominated manga artist, illustrator, writer, content creator, and small creative business owner at the intersection of horror media, alt nerd culture, alt plus nerd, but I'm just uh, <laughs> collapsing those two, uh, and schlocky film. Uh, her work blends Japanese manga and vintage American comic and pulp aesthetics. She specializes in traditional ink and color illustrations and uh, manga art, focusing on dark, fantastical, and dramatic themes. And um, Tingu, over here, is a multi... Oh, I'm sorry, Gigi, where are you? I'm On the at floor. Uh, W16A. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. where I'm at. Uh, and last and certainly not least, Tingu is a multidisciplinary artist with passions ranging from large format hand sculpting to slow cooking warm autumn stews. Wow, okay. Uh, in 2020, Tingu de uh, debuted his comic Square Hole, a queer existential character study that went viral and has since garnered over 25,000 subscribers, over half a million active engagements, 
and has been featured by publishers like Web Comics and Tapas. His new steamy lesbian trauma-informed vampire comic, The Cannibals, has, uh, been, has just been released by Field, uh, Field Mouse Press, and you can pick it up here at SBX in the Field Mouse Press table, M1B2. Thank you for that uh, information. And uh, he's working on a new historical fiction epic, which he can't wait to share with you soon. Okay. So everyone, welcome. It seems our slideshow is uh, operative. So with that said, I would like to proceed to the diabolical questions. Okay. So question one, just to kind of get us on the same page. So many artists, and I'm sure most people here, uh, experience a moment of artistic conversion that dramatically changes the way they work. And is there one particular conversion that made you decide to pursue horror in your work? So maybe we can just go down the line, as it were, and share that experience with us. This is probably the experience of almost every 90s kid, but I was exposed to Yonan Vasquez at a very small age. Yes! Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Honestly, probably one of the best inkers ever, but the way that he draws gore with spot blacks completely changed the way I looked at it in a way that was so appealing that literally to this day, I'm still trying to imitate what he's doing. Hopefully I'm succeeding, hmm. but uh, as a former edgy 13 year old, okay. definite turning point. I can, you know, I can also attach like a, um, uh, a second subterranean question to that. Is there an influence you're trying to escape? Uh, Think about it. Who haunts you? Haunts me. That's really interesting, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the same answer. <laughs> That's very telling. Okay. Thank you. Tingu, how about, how about you? Uh, for me, definitely my turning point was like going to dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, I, yeah, therapy okay. kids, yes, get help, <laughs> self-improvement. Uh, so I think like having more, you know, self-reflectiveness and then kind of finding ways to channel that in like a physical, tangible way. Like it, I picked comics because of my childhood. Yeah, <laughs> Johnny, <laughs> and then, um, uh, and then the, I feel like my worst nightmare is being associated with like Junji Ito. Oh. I, I'm, I know, no, Junji, I'm, I'm trying not to look at you, but it's like people always are telling me my stuff is Junji Ito because I feel like I draw anime looking characters and it's mm. body horror. So I just get like thrown in this mm. pigeonhole, but I love him. I love him, but. I mean, how can you not? How can I don't you know, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Corinne? Um, so when I was a kid, I, was really into Edward Gorey and mm. you know so yes, already already yes. sort of uh, you know drawn to the darkness and then I was raised Catholic which ah. <laughs> there you go Gee, really <laughs> and then um, you know I had like a lot of like really intense like familial deaths when I was a child okay. so it just really made me obsessed with death and thereby okay. horror um, and I guess if I'm trying to escape something, um, it would be the process of like undoing like unhealthy thought patterns, okay. which is a you know complicated and long process. But is there an artistic influence that you're, is kind of like you know hunchback? I don't know. Like I love art so much. I mean, there are certain styles that I don't really like, but okay. I've never I don't emulate or like. I'm not going for anything like that. That's something I'd have to really think about. The, I'm sure the, there's something. The burden of influence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I like adore my influences and wear them oh, on my sleeves. And Junji Ito is one of my top three very favorite artists. Very healthy. Okay. Junji Ito, Charles Burns, <laughs> yeah. and Al Columbia. Yeah. Oh, Charles Burns. Oh, indeed. <laughs> and uh, Gigi? Oh, okay. So... I am a TV and movies kind of girl, to be honest. Um, I didn't grow up reading a ton of comics, uh, especially not like horror stuff, mostly like Sunday funnies and stuff like that. So my main like inspiration to kind of get me through, to get me started with horror was honestly watching Tales from the Crypt, the like mm. old HBO. Nice. Yeah. 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 Delicious. Starting with that and um, <laughs> it kind of, I don't know, it kind of spiraled from there. Um, and I think you can kind of see that in my work also. Mm -hmm. um, like, I didn't even get to like the EC comics, like Tales from the Crypt, but even that, like the covers I'd seen and like, I'm sure you could see that in my work, but yeah. 
I think um, as far as inspirations go, um, oh boy, it's like, I don't know. I feel like it's an amalgam amalgam of like different things. Like I really, I really just like visuals and like aesthetics as opposed to like a specific artist for mm -hmm. horror. Um, but you know, obviously Junji Ito with the rest of the group. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's more of a vibe. I do like Graham Humphreys though. Um, that is somebody who I really, I'm really into, but yeah. And I think uh, trying to get away from, I think it's very, it's, I don't know how obvious it is, but definitely Junji Ito. I get that every other comment when mm. people look through my work. So yeah, I would say that. I think another big thing that I am a little afraid of is being derivative in like a very uninteresting way. Like I, I, I don't have a problem with like wearing my influences on my sleeve also, but I, I would prefer to do it in a way that's interesting and like new to people and like does like, it, it creates something different mm -hmm. while still being familiar to mm -hmm. people. Um, and if I'm not doing that and it's just derivative, then I think that is like, that's the worst in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so the other question, and then I, I'll, I'll be more specific, but I'm very curious about this. So is there something about comics specifically that you find especially productive for horror. And Andy, I know that you, uh, you know, develop games, um, but I'm curious as to what is it about the medium of comics um, that you think is like the perfect apparatus uh, for this stuff? So like, something I find interesting is in a horror game, there are hallways you don't want to walk down because you don't mm -hmm. want to see what happens. Mm -hmm. In a horror comic, I try to make you scared to turn the page, and I think mm -hmm. that's like, if you're making the reader afraid to progress time and like have their own relationship with like that media, I think that's why like comics and games, anything that requires a level of interaction, I think, is an excellent, excellent medium for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Anyone else want to chime in? What is it about comics? I've been a lover of books in general wow. since I was a child. Um, I was raised by my mom and my grandparents, and you know they had an, um, my grandfather had an amazing collection of National Geographics mm -hmm. and just tons of old weird books. So I've always just loved books. Mm -hmm. So and being a visual artist, just combining the two things of you know narrative storytelling um, with the visual art is mm -hmm. kind of a no-brainer. And then. I was a film video major for my undergrad. Uh -huh. And so I really think, you know, there's a huge parallel between, you know, like storyboarding for a film sure, or sure. just like conceptually just thinking about how you're going to set up the structures for a film and mm -hmm. comics. And I'm a huge film freak. So mm -hmm. it's just like everything I love in one unit, you know? Yeah. Horror kind of like thrives on the beat to beat storytelling too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I kind of want to jump in on that. Sure. Um, as far as like the film stuff, like for me, like as somebody who's coming into horror more from like a film and like TV media lens, I find that like with horror comics, it is like a little bit more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a time where like Blockbuster was a thing and like <laughs> I grew up super poor. So I was not able to like I didn't have access to like horror movies the way I wanted to, but I always had like a library card. So I could always like, you know, I could always read whatever was around. So I think that's what makes um it may not be like as like functionally like as a comic what makes mm -hmm. it good for horror, but like I think that's like what's important about horror and comics. Yeah. Why it's a good medium for it. Man, you, you got me thinking as well. I feel like I grew up on comics because of that, yeah. like library the cards. The accessibility of it. The yeah. accessibility. Yeah. And I think of like the history of zines and comics in general as a yeah. political art that could be just like, you know, shared with anyone. Yeah. And horror is oftentimes like used as like, may not, it may not always be in the most positive light, but like a way to like uh, highlight the fears of like the community or like the yeah. country or, you know, mm -hmm. you know, underlining ideas that may or may not be true, but mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that, you know, I had a, a conversion moment uh, early on at Boca, and I remember Cliff Chang, you know, of Paper Girls, um, said that he wanted to uh, be a filmmaker, but the process seemed so daunting that he just decided to make a comic book, and I think that sense of accessibility, I think the cinematic format of comics, 
Uh, I certainly think the the beats of it um, are, you know, very uh, interesting. And of course, you just have this amazing range of style, you yeah. know, and it, you can be, I guess, uh, for lack of better of a term, it can be polyamorous in all of your stylistic, uh, you know, decisions and affectations. So just to kind of go specifically into your project, so um, Andy, so you uh, really converge uh, humor and horror uh, in your work. And so I'm curious as to, you know, why that resonates for you, why you find that a potent combination. I think that's legitimately how I deal with the world because okay. <laughs> like, well, I went, not to be like, I've had a tough life, but like when things go bad in my life, I think my immediate reaction is to react with humor. Like my comic Jennifer's body is about me, you know, dying in the hospital. Spoiler alert, I lived, uh, but <laughs> uh, I got diagnosed with a tumor and as I was bleeding out, I remember just trying to joke with the doctors and make them feel better because I was like, you're all very stressed. Like, you know, I, I need to like, goof around, like, come on, you know, and uh, I think part of that is a knee-jerk reaction to when bad things happen, but another part of it is the lens through which I view things, but also it feels more real to talk about horror and comedy in that conjunction, because I think that's just how I see the world, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's, like, in my opinion, lots, horror comedy specifically has had such a huge boom in the last 10 or 15 years. Definitely. Yeah, and, and people have taken it... The problem with comedy is a lot of people take comedy unseriously because they think beca because you're making them laugh, not a lot of thought goes into it. But I, mm -hmm. obviously, anybody who likes comedy feels differently about that. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, you're getting like you know what we do in the shadows. Oh, yes, the best. yes, the so greatest. Yeah, just really excellent work. <laughs> so good. It's nice mm. to see the genre grow. Mm. Yeah. You know, this is uh, so one of the classes that I teach is uh, humor. You know, I teach humor, humor theory. And one interesting observation is that, uh, you know, tragedy and comedy, uh, and laughter and tears, they're involuntary responses. Mm -hmm. And so people describe this uh, along the lines of like the sublime, where, you know, you're confronted with something um, in horror, for instance, but you have usually have a way out, you know, so there's a kind of sense of delight. And, uh, and comedy is, uh, you know, it's precisely that space where, you know, you always have a way out. And so when those two are combined, no exit plus, oh, thank God, it's all okay. Mm -hmm. It's an especially delightful uh, combination of extremes, you know. And uh, I agree, it's, it's a, for me, the most magical genre. And, you know, the first film I think I saw in the theater here was American Werewolf in London. They let yes. me in. Classic. And uh, I've been processing it ever since. <laughs> uh, so, and on that note, uh, I don't want to go necessarily in order, but Corinne, I, I, I it feels like you know your book is so much about processing trauma yeah. and working through things, and it's, it has this very, very rich psychoanalytic dimension. And yet, at the same time, it's visually so exuberant. You know, it's so beautiful and bright and festive. Yeah. And and of course, you employ psychedelic aesthetics. Yeah. And so I'm wondering how that resonates for you, because that I find that to be a kind of unlikely pairing between this. Um, I don't like Technicolor, <laughs> well, although it does, of course, has a uh, um, filmic history. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so Acid Nun, um, you know, I put like my whole heart into that book, mm. and it was about a lot of deeply emotional personal yeah. things, and like I was hopeful that, you know, when the book was finished, um, I'm well aware that there's other people out there who have had very similar experiences and, you know, um, I was really hopeful that uh, that book could, you know, really reach some people, maybe even help them with some of their own, um, you know, stuff they're trying to process, just feeling not so alone. And for me, um, if, if a story, and this is not throwing shade at any other stories, by the way, but if a story is just a downer and it's just always down mm -hmm. you know it's harder to gleam stuff out of that and mm -hmm. I really felt like if I can make this fun like a journey that we go on together and there's like delight and humor mm -hmm. and fun and like just over the top like extravagant visuals, mm -hmm. I thought that the story might land with people better. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I guess one of the most integral things for me is like, 
I'm trying to speak to the audience from my heart. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'm trying to get on the page. Mm -hmm. And I have like a really weird process that I don't even want to try and... Now we have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just tease well, I just I, I kind of write as I go. Oh, okay. And I know a lot of people, um, you know, I have the whole thing sort of like the whole concept for the story, like the skeleton, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I actually write them issue by issue. Okay. And so it's a little, there's a little more improvising that happens. And the thing that I really like about that is it, it, it has a freshness to the story. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I plan the whole thing out tooth and nail, it's almost like I'm imprisoning myself and I, I won't have the joy of, yeah. quite as much joy of doing it, if that makes any sense. So, um, you know, it's just a little bit of a scattered, I like mm -hmm. to call it like a feral process. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, on that note, I feel like, uh, you know, the aesthetic um, is that wonderful way of uh, distancing yourself from mm -hmm. things that, you know, maybe too intense or too close. And so it makes a lot of sense that it has this, you know, in a sense, a kind of shield um, it working through some very, very serious things, but it has this, um, you know, really beautiful, a sense of artifice to it. Absolutely. Um, and uh, Tingu, so you overlap um, horror and uh, desire. And so the, the, I, you know, I found uh, the work very, you know, it's seductive. It's so much about uh, intimacy. Um, and I'm wondering how you think of this as a kind of matrix to explore. Yeah, I mean, we all do. <laughs> we, yeah. We're horror artists. Yeah. Like, I feel like uh, desire, longing, the other, like mm -hmm. it's all very sim big O, sure, other. Sure. Like, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, similar to everyone else, too, I'm just going to steal everyone else's answers also. Mm -hmm. it's, I feel like, like you got to figure out ways to make the lemonade a little salty and, you know, a little sweet in mm -hmm. addition to the sour. So I think uh, creating that, like, seductive or alienating feeling and hopefully, like, little crumbs of treats mm -hmm. throughout with comedy or whatever it might be is uh, it's just, like, the best approach I've found. Mm -hmm. I, really, I really think about the other a lot, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, anyway, I, this is a question. I'm not going to frame it as, a, as an answer. And so, Gigi, so when I was reading your, your stuff, you know, uh, Resenter in particular, it has just, it's like, feels very televisual. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I'm wondering how, you know, you see that relationship. I mean, you just told us that you're, you know, a TV <laughs> and film buff. But um, so how you work with the medium and I think also there is um, you know in the anthology there's this very like it definitely reminded me of like Tales from the Dark Side and some mm -hmm. of these things that just kind of circle back to this really neat little reveal and so I'm wondering how you negotiate that sense of influence do you see comics as as like always in dialogue with these other media and that's what you try to bring in yeah, I think I do see it in dialogue with these other, with the, you know, with TV and, mm -hmm. uh, and film. Um, yeah, when I am doing my storyboarding, I am, like, in my mind, I have no trouble with that process of storyboarding. I know a lot of um, uh, other comic artists have problems with uh, the visuals of, like, how to storyboard things out. Mm -hmm. But like, I watch so many movies. <laughs> I watch so many, I watch so much TV and so many movies that I'm like, oh, I have an idea already of how this is gonna go based on how it was filmed in this movie and I might change the camera a little bit just to like, mm -hmm. so it's like, that is, that's what I'm doing when I'm working on my stuff, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think there is, there's certainly a connection there for sure for me and working on my stuff, yeah. Film on paper. Film on paper, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to create a, a bit of a saga, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, a saga that's not necessarily a saga, but yeah. Something that you could see moving, even though like it's on the page and it's actually not moving, but something that you could imagine like jumping off on its own and like moving in front of you, like a, like a show or, or film. Mm. Yeah. Looking forward. Uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, other questions? 
other diabolical questions. Mm -hmm. um, so body horror is, as we all know, very, very niche, right? Like, I will consume anything, supernatural horror, sign me up, slasher, not, not my jam. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but body horror is like a very, very specific thing. And so I'm curious, like, what draws you to that? And why, again, why comics, but why that little micro genre? You want to see yucky stuff. As far as I'm Ripping concerned, flesh. all having a body is body horror. So, <laughs> there like, you go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But legitimately, like as a trans person who grew a tumor, your body is horrifying and it does not okay. do what you want it to do. Okay. But like I've always really liked genres of body horror that deal with that sort of a kind of an idea. Like in the video game Dragon Age Origins, there is a character who is a lesbian and leaves her husband and ends up like uh, in these underground deep roads and becomes basically this horrifying amalgam of like afabness where she is forced to be a mother mm -hmm. when that is obviously the most horrifying thing to her mm -hmm. and silent hill does a very similar thing as well yes. yeah yes. that kind of thing yes. like when i say body horror is a real expression of emotional insides but you're making your emotional outsides i feel like that's what i'm trying to do and that's what i like best when i'm like reading mm -hmm. oh my my sweet tate my my baby <laughs> That's Tate McGillicuddy. Uh, he has PTSD, and when he has PTSD attacks, he turns into an eldritch monster. <laughs> um, so his dad is his abuser, and the big reveal in part two, slasher you, spoilers, uh, you find out that when Tate, Tate spends most of his time as a human, but when he has difficulty and lashes out, he becomes an eldritch horror, his dad is permanently both at the same time, mm -hmm. and the big reveal is that his dad has never even tried to control or fix or help, and he thinks that you know, I had it that bad, so Tate, you should have it that bad. And the whole plot line with him is, do you want to keep that elder chore inside you for safety? Do you want to split it apart from you? Is it a part of you? Is it you? Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. um, not to trail off, but. No, that's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, correct. Um, for me, um, I think the word I would use is release. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you've struggled with any sort of anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, any of that stuff, mm -hmm. uh, just like the fantasy of being like released from like the human body and there's yeah. an image of my work yeah. and I have a particular like sort of vor fantasy thing of like someone just devoured me, then mm. like, I don't have to take care of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, they're just kind of doing it for me. Uh, it's like a horror swaddle. Right? Yeah. yeah, and, and yeah. it's definitely a euphemism for sex. <laughs> just putting that out Thanks. there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, in psychoanalysis, there's that uh, sort of concept of mastering the trauma through repetition, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so you kind of forcefully, uh, or on purpose, you expose yourself to this in a way of exorcising mm -hmm. these, um, these um, you know, scarring memories and uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, and Tingu, how about you? Man, I, I love that you bring up psychoanalysis. It's like, yeah. you know, along with cinema, I feel like, you know, even Warhol. Like, I feel like I'm really attracted to, like, social commodity as trauma also. Or, you know, we live in this neoliberal system. Like, yeah. all of this stuff is, you know, it, there is something from both of you where it's like, for me, it's also like manifesting it into something real and tangible and what it feels like, like the inside out kind of thing. And then in addition to the trans stuff, in addition to like mm -hmm. it being like a, a fantasy of release as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think like also I, I come from a history of like survivors and uh, mm -hmm. from like genocides and stuff. So I feel like for me, it's also it, that social aspect is so important. Like I think I always feel the bodies behind me, you know, in mm -hmm. front of me. Like I, I always like want to see that in a physical way because I feel like a lot of people don't talk about it or see it you know what I mean and, uh, there is like actual data that says generational like trauma has, is carried on through the yeah through yeah. the body in so, genetics yeah. too yeah. like epigenetics like it actually yeah. impacts your genes you know mm -hmm. um, absolutely yeah. and Gigi how about you yeah so um, why why do you want to see <laughs> <laughs> I want to see all that because I I go through that. Um, I don't. Sh I haven't shared this like super publicly, but I, I'm going to share it now. But I actually have an autoimmune disease. I have Crohn's disease, and I've had it since I was 
about 15, 15, 16, um, very early high school. And um, yeah, when you have an autoimmune disease, uh, specifically something in the gut, which is like the body's second brain, um, there are a ton of different like symptoms that come up with it and different things you have to deal with. Um, so, you know, in taking in humor, like, I gotta, you know, I'm good with the bathroom jokes. So if you need a good potty <laughs> joke, like come through. But <laughs> um, even in getting medication and being treated for Crohn's, like there's all these different things that happen. And like, you know, so it, for me, body horror is a way to relate to my own body. Mm -hmm. um, I just, within having the Crohn's, like I'm going through all these different things. Like I've had hair fall out. I've had an overproduction of yeast. I've had like, you know, like problems with skin and like all these other different things. Um, in addition to having like just normal human body stuff, my teeth fall out as a kid, I have a uterus, like I have all these things happening. Yeah. So like, you know, I, it's hard to deal with that stuff in a solitary space when like family and friends don't really know how to relate to you or like what to say. Mm -hmm. But in body horror, um, regardless of the medium that it's coming in, there's always somebody else that can relate to you. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times they're going through something way worse. <laughs> so it's like, oh, okay, it's not that bad. I don't have like another face on my face or something. <laughs> it's not so bad. It's not so yeah. bad. But even so, um, you know, it's, it's still nice to have something else to relate to that I don't, I don't have to share with anybody else. Um, in the same way that my bodily experiences and all the things, the changes happening there are mine and I'm dealing with it alone, I can embrace this story or this movie, um, you know, or this comic where body horror is the subject by myself. Mm -hmm. And I can process all the things that are happening to me on my own. And if mm -hmm. I decide to share that outward, then I share it outward, but otherwise, um, yeah, and as somebody who's going through all that and who's also like a cartoonist and like drawing these things, um, I can also do that for somebody else who is, you know, feeling the way that I do, regardless of if they are trans person or if they have like an autoimmune disease or, you know, if they're going through anything else with their body, then they also don't have to like deal with it like alone, so, mm. yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> if I can sort of maybe raise a common thread is one of the things that brings us to this and give, makes it, in a sense, like, you know, visions of torture, visions of disembowelment, all kinds of, um, you know, grotesque, terrifying um, uh, depictions is that it connects us to our own embodiment. And in a way, it's, it's very grounding because, of course, we're all dealing with our mortality. Um, again, maybe to draw the analogy between horror and humor, you know, like these are kind of extreme states of the body. And this is something that also comes up um, around discussions of humor is that it always circles around, you can say, a kind of dark sun, you know. And that's death, you know. Yeah. Like we all necessarily deal with our... Um, uh, with our mortality, and of course, it comes up in desire, illness, um, aging, you know, uh, and, and I feel like this is sort of like a genre that is, you know, especially um, fit for channeling these experiences and, uh, and processing them. But the other thing I guess I'm curious about is that, you know, do you find there, and I'm, I want to get your takes on this because it's, it's a micro genre to a certain extent, but I'm wondering how you see it participate in the larger landscape. Is there an uptick in body horror that you're seeing now as sort of you know, cultural producers and cultural consumers? Uh, and what do you think that's about, if there is one? I definitely think it's more popular, and I'm gonna be honest, I have no idea. I'm happy okay. about it, Yeah. but uh, it's kind of like, I suspect it's one of those things that a lot more people liked, but there wasn't as much media like mm -hmm. easily available, but again, I'm just spitballing here. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a, like monster fucking has gotten very popular, but as far as I know, everybody who likes it has been Wait, on what board it, since what the, is, what is you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, where, where can I find this and what is it? Uh, Tumblr.com. Uh, <laughs> 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 
But I, I wonder if like the internet hasn't made it easier to find other people who are just into what you're into. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I I think horror is having a moment right okay. now, yeah. which is amazing. And then you have companies like A24. Yes. Love A24. But like the concept of elevated horror, oh, I find a little bit irritating. <laughs> okay. um, and this gets to the very important thing of like, so horror has been a genre forever. Yes. You know, I mean, people were telling stories over campfires like yes. a long time ago. And I've always felt like it gets sort of put on a, a lower shelf. Mm -hmm. Like it's mm -hmm. not the, you know, it's the Eisner project. winning category, you know? And um, I do think it's getting more respect. I really do. And, you know, you have things like Alan Moore's From Hell. You know, you have, you do have examples of yeah. incredibly well celebrated uh, horror authors, artists. Mm -hmm. But I would like to see the day where, you, you know, there's just as much respect and it's not like looked at as this like trash genre. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't know. Maybe I'm being a little. No, I completely I agree with you, I kind of like the actually. trash genre though. <laughs> I just wish that that was where the respect was. Like regardless of yeah. what, like mm -hmm. it's, it's fine to come from trash. Like trash is fine. <laughs> like there's nothing wrong with that. But like let that be respected to what though. Precisely, you know? yeah. yeah. We can have Shakespeare and trash, it's fine. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I feel like especially recently, like with COVID, a lot of people I knew that were never not getting their like therapeutic support and stuff like have mm -hmm. also moved closer to this, you know, exploring different genres as well. Yeah. And mm -hmm. just seeing that shift of like collective mass trauma as well. And, you know, and then it's been a rough few years with elections, you know, in a rough, rough political climates. Like I think in moments like this, this is where that bottom shelf like is pulled to the top. Like people are like, oh yeah, we have that back of that genre that like is also people suffering. Like I think a lot of people, like it's my solace during this time too, mm -hmm. where I'm like looking for more of that content because of what I see around me, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think the past five years, we were all like in a Lovecraftian horror, to be honest. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's rough, it's yeah. pretty rough. Guys. I think we're still kind of, we're trying to move out of it, but I feel like we're still kind of kind of in, in it right now. Yeah. 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 Well, you mentioned something so, um, you know, so on point that like during the height of the pandemic, people were watching pandemic films like outbreak and yes. so it's this idea that like well at least you can kind of control this you yeah. know it's yeah. so out of your control it's so overwhelming it's so powerful but here is this art form that allows you to just kind of like ritualistically absorb it at least you can kind of control the dosage of it you yeah, know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I keep thinking of it like in a way I mean there's I don't know this is just like a theory let's say but I feel like we also think of society as a kind of body you know and, and so I feel like the, the genre sort of addresses that, like when, when you have radical transformation, you have uh, these cultural manifestations, and so you will have like an uptick in horror. You will have, uh, I was looking this up, like what are the films that identify, that are like specific to the Trump era? You know, like, like so there is, you know, if we're looking at these patterns, but that's sort of a pet theory that we somehow not only have a, a kind of uh, vision of us as a body, as a, as a mental, you know, framework, but at the same time, as it's it's expanded in, in in terms of just how we envision, like the body politic, the United States as something that's perhaps either bounded or in states of dis-ease, and so on. So maybe that sort of explains it um, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So you've kind of addressed this a little bit, but I'm wondering if, if and then we'll, we should really open it up to questions. I'm sure people have many questions here. Um, but is there one misconception about horror? Because you know, it's like if you're a niche and if you are making stuff that's gross or freaking other people out, and you were like, no, 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 you don't understand. It. Um, so what is that misconception that you'd like to really correct? I think the number one is that if somebody makes work that is scary, violent, deplorable, that that would make the author somehow, yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, morally, you know, Brilliant. corrupt. And that yeah. is That's absurd. Yes. Because yeah. we need to have fiction. Yeah. We need to have stories and imagination. 
Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. No. People are literally like <laughs> bringing back the Hayes Code level of like, oh, you cannot depict tying a lady up to the railroad tracks uh, unless yeah. you're explicitly making it clear that you would never do this in real life. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hundred percent. It's a little scary sometimes, yeah. you know. Yeah. Anyone else want to chime in? I think it's also <laughs> like. I think another misconception is that I don't know. Like, there's kind of like to your point, but like that something is wrong with you as a consumer of these types of mediums. Um, like, I don't know. I just in my personal experience, like <laughs> more lore. But I grew up Jehovah's Witness. And so I wasn't allowed to watch a lot of like, I wasn't allowed to like watch Harry Potter at my aunt's house. And I was like, it's Harry Potter, but we don't need to have a Harry Potter discussion. But, <laughs> but it's, if you want. We really don't. But it was like, you know, like it's fine. We can watch these things because it's not like, they're not all meant to be horrific. Like some of it is meant to be incredibly cathartic mm -hmm. and like, you know, while, you know, we sometimes we do want the trash and like watch the final girl do her thing, but like sometimes it's just a moment, like hereditary, a moment. Like if you ha have had like family issue or family trauma in the past, it's like, ooh, this is a moment. Um, mm -hmm. Ignore the beheadings at the end, but this is a moment <laughs> right here. <laughs> so I think that people need to kind of like separate the idea that, yeah, because like there's something horrific happening that like, the creator is horrific, or the people consuming these things are like horrific, terrible people. So, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. I'm so gonna good. double click into the, that idea. Double too. click. Let's, it. let's go. Let's <laughs> double click. Yeah. Uh, I think that also part of that is like what we consider horror and what horror as such a huge genre is. Like, to me, I, I'm obsessed with reality TV. It is oh. to me the scariest of all. Like, 90 Day Fiance. <laughs> 90 day let me fiance. tell you, it's yeah. dark stuff. It's not a, it's not a joke. It's yeah. like, and My I think like, pleasure. yeah, it's yes. such a guilt. <laughs> and it's like, to me, it's also like, it's how horror manifests emotionally and in terms yeah. of abuse and violence and like this interpersonal, yeah. social, multicultural violence. Like, I just think that like, yeah, like horror has, is just so huge and so many people consume horror in their day-to-day -day lives, like average people who don't read, mm -hmm. you know, like body horror. And I think mm -hmm. that they just don't see it in that lens, but mm -hmm. I think that it's, you know, just keep an open mind. Like, Can I everything. just add on to that super quick? Like it kills me that some people who are like, oh my God, you watch horror movies, horror? Yeah. Like that's What's so wrong bad. With you? Yeah. But then... <laughs> These will be the same people that watch like forensic files and true crime. And it's like, <laughs> are you true crime? Yes. There we go. It's like that's horror. That's right. Yeah. That's... But also, like my horror is fictional. Like you're talking about real Thank situations, you. and that's terrifying yeah. to me. So like monetizing off of it, like yeah. it's scary in a lot of ways. Right. Like, exactly. At least my horror is like my horror is ethical. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, uh, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, th you know, uh, I want to turn it up to questions, but I just want to uh, double click <laughs> into, your, into your responses. I mean, I feel very strongly that, you know, we need a space for fiction. We yeah. need a space yeah. where we, we vent our nocturnal energies uh, productively in a safe way so they don't spill out yes. yeah. and make us maladjusted citizens who, you know, then push this cruelty onto others. Yeah. And I yes. think that this is where the space 100%. of horror is, you know, it's a, it's a kind of like, someone described, I discovered this thing called Buhurt, where people put on armor and beat the hell out of each other. Oh, with, night with fighting! Yeah. Yes! Yep. And this one woman, she said, like, and, and this one woman, he's like totally armored, she said like, I believe in consensual violence. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, whoa, that is a heavy term. But I feel like horror, you know, is that space where yeah. like you're kind of free. Yeah. You yeah. can indulge these energies, you can work through them, you can go really deep, and you have a willing audience that's there with you. Yeah. They say, You're okay, I'm okay with this. Yeah. You know yeah. What I mean? yeah. And I feel like that's just really critical, really as like a sign of democracy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That we have this preserve where we can do this. Yeah. Um, so for me, I think it's very vital as, you know, on many levels. Corin, you look like you want to oh, say something. Oh, I'm just something. listening to you as No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, But anyway, but, uh, so anyway, so I just wanted to, you know, double click on this and I do feel very, very strongly as, as someone, uh, Tingu, in therapy, mm -hmm. a believe, great believer and I would hope a, a 
productive member <laughs> of this community, thanks to therapy, yeah. um, that, you know, it's like we are definitely bundles of very, very chaotic, entropic things. And thank, thank God for art, that it gives us a container for them and is able to channel it in ways that uh, it becomes a generosity to yeah. others, right? Yes. So with that said, I would love uh, for people to take the mics and if you have questions for our, um, I think there's, oh no, do you wanna, right here in the front, yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh, so, okay, I think you're supposed to line up. Oh, yes. line up. Yeah, back there, Come yeah. Come on down. Shoot. <laughs> you get a mic and you get a mic. <laughs> yeah, and let's see how we do, okay. Uh, yeah. Please. Oh, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so since you brought up Junji Ito as something that's like kind of annoyingly following around, like people point at stuff and say, that's Junji Ito. It reminded me, so I was at Anime NYC a month or so ago. They had Zach Davison there, the manga translator. Yeah. And he translates uh, Go Tanabe's work, who's a guy who does a lot of Lovecraft stuff, like stuff based on Lovecraft stories. And he was saying, Tanabe gets mad. He sort of told him, like, everyone comes up to me and points at me and says, your work's just like Junji Ito. And Tanabe <laughs> says, no, it's not. Like, I do not care about Junji Ito. It's Shigeru Mizuki. That's me. I was wondering, like, as folks who are engaged in horror art, like, why do you think it is as much as people do love Junji Ito? And while Junji, Junji Ito is, like, undeniably pretty great, like, what is it about his stuff, do you think, that, like, has people pointing at other horror art and saying, that's Junji Ito, whether or not it looks like Junji Ito? Because that's probably the one horror artist that they know. Exposure, yeah. 100%. <laughs> I think he also, like, like he kind of synthesizes this, like, he's this gateway from Japanese manga also mm -hmm. in the late, two, you know, 2010s or 2020s, like, into, right, like, you know, alt comics, too. Mm. Like, I feel like he, you know, when I was growing up with Junji Ito, he was, like, really my, my icon for, you know, that kind of classical horror, because he grew up on Lovecraft and all yeah. these, like, classic horror, American Western kind of yeah. horror tropes, too. Yeah. I can't even be mad when somebody points it out in my stuff, because he is a huge, like, influence, so it's, like, as much as I... It's not that I don't like it, it's just like, all right, you guys, I need a different compliment, because that's getting old. <laughs> But, but yeah. it's like Junji Ito has been influenced by other manga artists, you know, like Kazuo Umezu, you, say, you know, right, like. Kazuo. I thought you were going to say Junji Ito is even inspired by Junji Ito. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that's true. Like, <laughs> literally Junji Ito. Yeah. Heavy, heavy inspiration. All. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's, let's switch sides. How about right here? Yeah, I wanted to ask kind of how you would introduce somebody who hasn't really traditionally been interested in body horror, but who, like, I'm thinking of my mother in particular. Like, I'm in my mm -hmm. 30s, she's just becoming 60 years old, and we both share a lot of experiences in terms of, like, betrayals of the body, like medical issues, mm -hmm. things like that. And, you know, I want to, to form a deeper relationship with her in terms of, you know, t dovetailing our interests together. So mm -hmm. how would you kind of initiate somebody into that who kind of maybe has watched Silence of the Lambs and been compelled by it, but that's about it? Sorry I mean, if one. they can stomach it, the thing would be a great, but that might be a little <laughs> high level. I don't know. Mm. Maybe the original thing before John Carpenter's? Ooh. <laughs> nice one. Maybe try different media, too. Again, like uh, TLC has like the gross my foot, or you know what I mean? Oh. Like the, those like really messy. Let me tell you, like you never know what old housewives are into. It's like there's a range of cool media. Um, my usual suggestion is like if you're not used to a bunch of gore and schlock go really cheesy like Evil Dead or Shaun of the Dead or something yeah. and see yeah. what your tolerance level is yeah. 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 Shaun of the Dead is a good one to start off with mm -hmm. I, I would also like gauge your mom's tolerance for that too. like yeah. heavy because like body horror it, like it's really not for everybody mm -hmm. and like if she's if you, if you see like hints then maybe go further but if she's really not into it it's not for everybody but I, I would relate it back to her personally since she's getting older like those changes like well, this is why it might be a good idea to look into this because this thing is happening with this person's body. This thing's happening with your body. <laughs> yeah, like, like tie it together. Yeah, yeah sometimes it's just transformation. Like, <laughs> What's going on here? Bread crumb it to her. <laughs> like, thinking. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Okay, and so let's let's go back to side A. Um, okay. So my question is more about like uh, craft 
Um, when mm. you're depic depicting like those gore horror scenes, like horror gore scenes, there we go. Um, do you prefer like digital traditional or do you like do a blend when you get to those particular scenes? I do everything pencil and ink for the black line work. And then I, um, if it's color, I do digital coloring. But that, that's just my preference. I know a lot of uh, artists use like Wacom tablets or Procreate now. And I use Procreate for coloring, but um, all of my stuff is starts with pencils, inks, erase, scan. I actually like try to go full traditional for horror because I also do YA comics and I do digital for that. But I do not think there is currently a way to correctly mimic ink wash and watercolor on like clip studio paint and procreate in a way that I find to be gross enough. You know, mm, yeah, like Let's get clean. yeah. And I don't know if it's just a matter of an organic material can mimic an organic texture, but like um, for uh, Jennifer's body, I used. Uh, Stuart Semple sells NFTs now, so maybe don't purchase this item, but he makes this series of paints called like World's Reddest Red, World, like World's Pinkest Pink or whatever, and I ended up like clotting the red paint to mimic the tumor, and that's definitely not something I could have done like digitally because wow. it forms a physical like shape, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so interesting. I love that we all work traditionally. Yeah, that's I cool. Do, yeah. Right? I, I figured, yeah. I figured, because yeah. I mean, we're horror people. We gotta feel yeah. our yes. horror, like gotta feel mm -hmm. I know, stuff. we're gonna wrap it up, I know, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so we have time for uh, a few questions. So we need, need to switch to the other flank. So how about over here? All right, so I mean, that's actually a good intro question to my question, which is mm -hmm. um, in gore and in body horror, there's a lot of overlap, but it's not the same thing. Could, uh, could you talk a little bit about how you conceptualize body horror in relation to gore and also outside of gore? That's a head scratch. Well, not a head scratch. That's a thinker, though, I think. This might not make sense, but I think body horror is something that happens to you or the perceiver, and gore is something that is forced upon others, typically. Not like, not like forced upon others, but like with body horror, it's an internal reflection of stuff that's going on with the character, but with gore, I feel like it's more like with the slasher movie, right? You know I, what I'm I trying understand. to say? It's, yeah. I feel like what you're trying to say is like body horror is what your body does to you, but gore is what some what someone does to you, yes. as opposed to like what your body, what what's happening internally with you. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I agree with that point. That yeah. sounds very neat. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I, it's great. Good, Good job, job, everybody. Yeah. 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 Good job, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Into the syllabus. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, I think we have we might have time only for one question, but you can definitely accost our panelists here. With <laughs> DM so us the question. You, yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here today. I am super, super excited about this panel, mm -hmm. and it did not disappoint. Um, my question is regarding uh, the notion of ethical consumption in body horror. Mm -hmm. So how do we as artists derive sources for our work? Um, I wonder what our own references are like and your thoughts on drawing from sources other than like anatomy textbooks or pre-existing art. Mm -hmm. How do you make distinctions about which references are exploitative? Ooh. Wow. That's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah, okay. I would like to know the answer to that too, because I <laughs> found some reference. I'm um, a big true crime fan, but I don't actually like looking at any images of victims of crimes. Sure. I think the, like, I've looked up images of, like, the body farm bodies, but those are, people, like, donated those bodies, you know? Mm. Um, Honestly, I just like look up references of people and then I turn it like they're not already f messed up. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like I just Are find references up? of people and then I mess them up. Yeah. <laughs> no, like I'm the same way. I'm actually really squicky about real gore, so I try to look yeah. at like SFX makeup and stuff. But exactly. I actually think it's full on unethical to like look at a crime scene photo from an unconsenting victim and turn it into content. Yeah. 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 I am unethical. I'm so sorry. That is okay. <laughs> no, I mean like like there are people who sell crime scene photos on Patreon. Like oh, that's a bit much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's different. Yeah, I, I'm sure that is not. I, I didn't do that. No, <laughs> yeah. I. Okay, just like for resent or something that uh, I did recently for some pages. There is somebody who gets hit by a car and killed, and I was like, I don't know what that looks like. I've seen people get hit by cars but not killed, and like 
you know, it wasn't gory. Um, and I was specifically looking for gore. And I checked on, I just, I searched it up on Google and I was like, I doubt this will come up. It's not 2002 anymore. I was wrong. <laughs> um, and I found some stuff and I was like, this is a lot, but I found my reference and I did that. I did not pay for the reference though. That's, that's yeah. a bit much. Like um, shilling people's, like that's, I think that's probably my beef with it. If it's like a I newspaper agree. photo, that's totally, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think these were articles. Yeah. Oh, and film stills. Yes. Film. Yes. Film is the big that's one. That's yeah, Movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, I feel like I always look at references because especially I was just talking about like yeah. historical trauma. That's not that's how I process. Pinterest, though. Like, you have yeah. to go to Google for that. Yeah. I Weird old Victorian diseases. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> books. Pu books. That, books. Yeah. Yeah. I have like domain. so many morbid anatomy books. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I you got to collect them all. We need the reference <laughs> list. <laughs> we need the list for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's some great ones. All right. all right. So I'm getting the signal. Everyone, thank you so much. Thank you thank all. You. Uh, uh, so take a take a photo uh, where you can track down these wonderful uh, creators in terms of their social media, their websites. Find them on the floor, support their practice, enjoy viscerality in whatever way you like to enjoy it. And uh, we'll see you out there in the wider world. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, and if you have questions, we can hang out briefly. <laughs>